Hey, and welcome to Access to Perspectives Conversations. Here's Joe Haverman, and with me today is Danny Chan. Welcome, Danny. Hello. <laughs> Hi, thanks for having me, Joe. It's exciting to, to be here. It's great having you. So, Danny, you are um, the director and founder of Biotech Without Borders. Um, please tell us a bit what you do in that organization and also mm -hmm. what brought you here. Why, why did yeah. you found it? So actually, not, not the founder. I, I'm the president right now, but the founder is um, a woman named Ellen Jorgensen, and she's founded some other uh, uh, community bio labs is what we call them uh, in the past. And so this is the second one that uh, she's made. And uh, I took over just before the pandemic, which is <laughs> a difficult, a difficult time. But uh, it's been it's been an interesting process. Um, community biology is this concept uh, like maker spaces. You can have uh, bring together the tools to do um, a variety of different experiments, benchtop experiments, molecular biology typically. Um, I bring them into a space where people can pay a membership fee and be able to use this equipment that they otherwise wouldn't be able to use in their homes. Um, and it's really focused on trying to increase the capacity to do biomedical, I mean, not even biomedical, just biology research uh, in general uh, to audiences that might not have a traditional pathway to, to, to gain this knowledge. Um, and so, yeah, th there's definitely a tradition of uh, ha hackers that, that exists within this space. Um, yeah, people call themselves biohackers sometimes. Community biology, I think, is the term now that uh, we try to use because um, it, it implies more that uh, it's more than just uh, solo projects, right, that are going out trying to, uh, you know, make some sort of, I don't know, disrupt something in, in the current way of, of things, uh, but rather um, some shared values, perhaps, are, are, are what we're trying to cultivate with our organization. Um, and yeah, I mean, I've been very inspired by um, community gardens, uh, thinking about the lab as if, you know, we all share this, this land. I mean, it's rented from an industrial building. So it's not, it's not quite just like land out there on, on the planet Earth. Um, but, but nevertheless, like we have to take care of it together and ensure this, the mutual safety of the people that work inside. But um, in, in return, right, we're able to access uh, capabilities that uh, typically folks don't have um, if they aren't affiliated with an institutional or a sort of an industry or an academic institution. <laughs> That's great. So um, how, how did you get to be interested in community biology and uh, what brought you in particular to Biotech Without Borders? Um, so what got me interested in community biology was probably um, a, a Wired article some time ago. I, I don't quite recall what it said, but it was it was about it was about uh, this type of space, this community biology lab. At the time, there weren't as many in the world. I was in graduate school uh, studying infectious disease at the time, and you know, just reading internet articles like one does, uh, read that there were groups that were trying to do. Um, research outside of that institution. And it had occurred to me <laughs> during my training to get to that point that a lot of the tools that I was using were very complex. Um, in fact, that's why I ended up going to school in the States. So I, I'm a Canadian citizen. And um, it, I did this co-op work term in school where I got to work in different labs to try to get some experience. Maybe that would, I thought it would help me find a job in the future. Um, and when I came to the States during one of those co-op work terms, my supervisor told me, ooh, the equipment is really nice here. So if you're able to get into a graduate program in the States, you'll have access to all this very cool equipment. So always in my head, I had you know, a mind to say, well, I want access to ask interesting questions using uh, interesting equipment, right? And I knew that there was a lot of infrastructure behind that. So reading this article in Wired saying that, you know, just community members were doing research, they, you know, bootstrapped something together, they found the connections that they needed to, I think it was a, maybe a sequencing run they did by taking, uh, taking a canoe out 
to sample some sediment from a city site and then sending it to some academic facility to be sequenced. But then the community sort of was able to ask questions with that data. I just thought that was amazing. <laughs> and so that was always at the back of my head as I was going through my training as a, a, a community that I wanted to make contact with sometime in the future. And so when I ended up dropping out of my PhD, I, I came to New York City <laughs> to, to meet these people and see what was it that they were doing that, um, that enabled them to do a project like that uh, that wasn't supported by a traditional structure. Um, and so in that process, I found out that while I was always interested in teaching, I found out that this is also an audience to teach uh, science to in a very different capacity than you would teach inside of a university structure. Um, mm. And it was, it was also very gratifying to, to, to teach in that, in that environment. Yeah. And I, I can, well, I imagine I've seen a few biotech um, community spaces also, and it's, I feel it's more engaging by its nature also you get to explain about biotech experiments in different ways than you would with peers in mm -hmm. your discipline and or other biology absolutely and it also gives us I a think... perspective right on 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 biotech research overall yes yes that that's a really good point and and that's what i was yeah thinking about it's teaching biology outside of the context of the university, people are concerned. Well, I mean, people will want to be entertained. So there's this element to, to teaching biology in this space that entertaining people is part of the job in that um, people don't need to learn this skill in order to find a research position or, or so forth. Some people do come to these classes with that intention, sort of uh, extracurricular outside you know, training. I think people are inspired by coding boot camps. And that was actually, that's an example of a very successful program that uh, like a, the community labs in, in New York City run, they say biohacker boot camp, right? So people come from various backgrounds. They want to just learn how to transform a plasmid into E. coli uh, or maybe do a restriction digest, something of that nature. Um, so there is an interest for like retraining, but often it also comes from just the enthusiasm to touch these 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 tools, these physical objects that actually are very divorced, I think, from everyday life. Um, but I mean, as I learned, as I was working in labs as a research tech, like it's not that strange. It's kind of like baking or kind of like cooking, right? Um, and there's something that changes, I, I believe, and I think there's some research, I, I'm not super uh, fluent in pedagogical research, but I believe there is an indication that um, like learning with your hands, right? In a, in, in, a, in a circumstance where there's maybe like an application that you're thinking about, um, project-based learning, right? This type of engagement really does change the way that we then utilize that knowledge. Um, and so it's through those types of education programs that we fulfill one part of our mission, which is to make this prep, make biotechnology more accessible. Um, and hearing people come from different walks of life into the classrooms, uh, you get very different types of questions. Uh, and as long as you're creating that sort of safe space that allows people to feel free to ask those questions, I think that there is a lot that as a teacher you learn about the way in which technologies are viewed, right, in, in the general society. Um, <laughs> like when you think about biotech, or, or I also then in part think about hazards or potential hazards is there any experiments mm -hmm. where you say oh we can't do that that would be too dangerous for for our participants okay. yeah absolutely that was so when the first round of community biology labs emerged that was i think very there's a lot of foresight being put into thought around um, making sure that these spaces are safe to, to do those types of things so we run BSL-1 style laboratories. And we ask that our members um, share with us their experimental plans. Uh, and then we also maintain like a list, white list of uh, reagents and things that we will allow inside of our organization and, and those that we won't. Mm -hmm. um, in some ways, this is very challenging because inside of the institution, like you have all these departments, internal departments to do all this work, but outside um, it has to be done you know, well, with our own, with our own oversight bodies. Um, but there's a community out there 
Um, there's this uh, Global Community Bio Summit is one example. But before that, there was a DIY bio and some people uh, got that discussion going between all the different labs that exist in this manner. And that discussion and those email lists actually are our important place to, to reach out in terms of finding support um, for uh, instituting these types of safety protocols that are required to, to work there. Um, I think it's still, you know, there's, there's always going to be a perception. <laughs> I think it's, I, I'm glad you brought it up because it is important to speak about a perception of like doing the science that um, somehow we like we require a certain level of institution or bureaucracy to keep us safe. Like the public places their trust within universities mm -hmm. uh, as, as uh, in order to keep them safe from, I don't know, some unknown, undefined danger. Um, but, you know, I think it's important to remember that that is a type of trust <laughs> and that even like well-established institutions can have um, difficulties like sort of executing on, on that type of thing. So uh, in our community, we try our best to forefront those values in terms of safety and thinking about the impact of one's work, not just to the safety of the individual, but the safety to the community at large. Um, and yeah, the existence of that program, I think, is, is, is exactly what exists in other institutions and so is what um, allows people to be creative in this space in, in a way that, um, that ensures their safety. <laughs> um, okay. Um... So now, after talking about the security aspects, what are um, maybe experiments that were brought into the lab that you've observed and maybe found surprising and like exciting mm. also to, to, to see ideas come up and experiments being run in that space that you provide? Right. So I would say, first I'll say that there's probably two types of experiments that get done in the space. One, one version is people that are driven by their curiosity or some hobby motivation, right? Just to play uh, within in the lab space. But then there's also another category of people where um, maybe they're trying to get some preliminary data for a grant application, uh, specifically those that feed into like private public partnership or maybe they're a startup and they want some like preliminary data to show investors this style. Um, and so those are like, so there are two kind of broad categories. And, and I mean, I, I actually am very agnostic to thinking about, I don't wanna say that those are the only two types of things that come into community biology labs because really the focus is on the infrastructure allowing people to think of their own uses. But you know, from spending time, I would say two categories come through. And so on the business side, you know, we've seen, uh, there's a story that comes from uh, Biotech Without Borders, but really the organization that came before us uh, when the staffing was more aligned uh, the way that we do it was um, just the pipetting robots, <laughs> trying to make low cost uh, robots to do pipetting. And um, yeah, that was just something I think that may have came from an iGEM team. So iGEM is um, a competition I think that's run out of Boston, but you know, it has international presence now. Um, they get high schoolers and undergraduates to put together some sort of scientific project and they take them through all this planning steps. So that was one of the early ways in which community biology labs provided a space, right, for, for individuals to, to launch a project such as that. And from that usually created like a initial organization that became very fruitful. So I, I don't quite remember the story, the origin story of it was an iGEM team, but it was some sort of, there was something related to that <laughs> where they were doing a lot of pipetting and then they realized, oh, this would be really great if we could automate it. And of course you're in a maker space. So people <laughs> want to make all sorts of things. And so like, let's make a robot, right? That could do that. Um, and then it was some confluence of meeting the right people uh, and, and those who were involved, that ended up being quite a successful company that spun off um, from the organization. And so this model of like incubatorness, so yeah, I, <laughs> talking a lot now, I think about one category, but, but it, because I think it's an interesting point mm -hmm. that to go to a, a business incubator now, sometimes, you know, founders can be given money because they believe they invest in the founder, you do something specific, but 
you know, it does, there is a gatekeeping effect there that happens and that it requires quite a bit of capital. Um, and my hope is that, you know, by opening a space like this and maintaining a space like this for some time within the city, um, there'll be other on-ramps for people with not as much capital or who investors wouldn't typically think like are the right type of person to put money into for those people to really prove to the world in some ways that they can get the data that at least the beginnings of the data that they need to, to build that confidence and then move into that particular part of our world's ecosystem, <laughs> right? The, the sort of biotech startup space. Um, so, okay, so that's one, that's one element, okay. <laughs> so the second element being people who come in purely on the curiosity level. Um, at, at that stage, I find it very fascinating to look at uh, like environmental monitoring. I think people become very, um, at least what I've experienced in the States where people are very aware that, um, you know, that there are environmental, it matters where you're looking for different contaminants. People want to know what's in their water, what's in their backyard. Um, and yeah, people do, there's a group right now who found some money through a, a company grant to sequence uh, soils and sediments from around the city and compost. Um, and they did that by partnering with some academics, but also partnering with city agencies somewhat uh, but it's all their initiative. They got the money to do the grants. And now they have all the sequencing data and we're able to um, find volunteers to do analysis on that and maybe start to articulate questions that um, people just don't think that you can ask, I think. Like uh, if, if you walk down the street and you ask folks like, you know, do you think that you could do uh, microbial monitoring, right, of a certain environment? I think most people would say no, but if you get five hours and some trained individuals around you, I think that answer changes to yes. Um, and so this type of project I think is quite interesting. Uh, what else have people been doing? So uh, sometimes there's some, there are, uh, there's a lot of global collaborations that are going on. One that's close to my heart right now is that I'm trying to get interns to work on this low cost enzyme production so, right, it's difficult to buy, sorry? Are you talking about Reclone? Reclone, like the open bioeconomy? I'm not sure if Reclone yeah, is part of that. They're, yeah, they're intertwined for sure. But which mm -hmm. one are you talking about? So, I mean, for us, we're talking, I'm, I'm being trying to speak with uh, this organization, Friendzymes. They were an iGen team. And then also the organization, Open Bioeconomy which I think comes from Shuttleworth founded um, investigator, Jenny, Jenny Malloy is one of the, yeah. yeah. And so like both of those groups are trying to do this research. And as a community lab, we have infrastructure. We also have need, like we would like to make enzymes for ourselves and not have that be a constant expense, right? Mm -hmm. And so, um, yeah, I'm quite excited actually for this summer we're, we're going to have some interns in and we'll be trying to research on this on this level. Um, just creating some uh, fluorescent protein that we need to calibrate equipment and then also creating polymerase that we use in some of the classes that we teach. Or maybe some members need polymerase and don't wanna buy it, right? They can make it instead. Hmm. Um, so yeah, so that's, that's what I'm pushing forward. I guess I'm also interested in doing things like making, you know, I was reading recently that um, Impossible Foods, <laughs> they make heme inside of yeast, right? And there's some lawsuit, I think, going on because other copycat companies have emerged, right? To, to also perhaps replicate that technology. But I, I'm sort of interested in just making it for the home scale, like not to sell, but like just to have like a yeast that tastes a bit bloody, right? Have that as a seasoning on my shelf, something like this. Um, so I kind of, I enjoy that kombucha people do a lot of like, I, there's a lot of links to food, I think sometimes, um, not necessary to consume it. So I think there's like work that has to be done to make sure that the things that we make in the lab are cons like safe to consume, but just like for the curiosity's sake, like to know what bacteria are growing your kombucha and there's some dream. It's actually from counterculture labs, another community mm -hmm. lab in the U S some dream to make a like a family tree of all the kombuchas just by like <laughs> meeting people and inviting them into the lab. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, that's something. Some artists, there's artist projects that go on here. 
I think someone is trying to make um, like grow um, cells up um, to maybe hearken to the the hot dog slime, you know, like this like heavily processed type of like food product um, and grow some cells within the lab in order to demonstrate some link between those. I'm not, I'm not quite sure. Again, I'm not like in these projects. I just sort of see them from above. Mm. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's, uh, yeah, I think that's, that's mostly everything. Oh, some people want to investigate. There's a group that wants to investigate different farming practices. So there's some traditional farming practices that um, leverage um, a, an initial inoculum that is collected from the environment. So they steam grains and then they put the grains into the environment, they get inoculated. And then that serves as the basis of a fermentation that then is spread over a field. And there's some interest in understanding that a bit better, maybe mechanistically or just, you know, identifying some species. And so there are some people that are coming to use that. Uh, um, and, then, and then some teachers, we have some teachers that come and to, to play around with the kits that they're buying from companies, right? So that they don't do it the first time in front of the students. And so that they, they can like fit that better into their curriculum. Um, yeah, so there's all sorts of interesting projects. And again, I, I don't want to like, offer these up in, in any way to limit the type of thought that should be around it, right? At the end of the day, what we provide as an organization is this infrastructure, the lab infrastructure. Um, and, you know, many other professions have this, like, you know, you have the wood shops and things that you can use for rent. And if you're trained in carpentry, you can go and you can make a project. But I feel like the equivalent is lacking for biologists. Mm. Um, and, you know, there's the reality that it takes a long time to get data. It's, it's difficult, right? It's not like a very, it's not an easy task to, to go down that path. But um, to have that option open, I think is very important. And to cultivate a community that's willing to support each other in the pursuit of some of these difficult, uh, difficult to acquire pieces of data, I think that that is actually quite valuable as well. Yeah. I think so too. There's, I would like to take you up on two or three lines of thought of what you just mentioned. Um, I'm yeah, absolutely. very much interested in global research equity. You mentioned the Open Bioeconomy um, Lab mm -hmm. and the work of Jenny Malloy and Mamboa and mm -hmm. um, Harry. Um, yeah. So, so yeah, what like, and also in terms of purpose-driven research, I, like what I hear from all the examples, and I've, I found that you provided quite a wide scope or a breadth <laughs> of, of topics that people bring into the community space. Um, mm -hmm. So would you say that the projects that, that are being worked on are for the most part purpose-driven? And I'm asking this because um, when I give workshops on anything science communication related and I ask the early career researchers, primarily PhD students of any careers uh, or, or year, um, why they do research, some say out of curiosity, which is I think also what you mentioned, like some people come because they're curious, they want to explore, which is also the beauty with research. Um, and the idea of becoming a researcher. And the other, I think it's almost 50-50, the other half says, I have a purpose. I want to, I want to help build a, or help to solve and mitigate climate change. I want to mm -hmm. um, help to develop a vaccine for this and that virus. Um, I want to mm -hmm. save the world. <laughs> I can <laughs> definitely parts of it. Um, so do you feel, um, I don't know, maybe the question is wrongly asked, but, but purpose no, no, I, role. I, I, hear, I hear what you're saying. Um, I think the pur purpose is definitely one of the major driving factors behind projects that enter this type of space. Um, and I think a big part of that reason, and, and also something that I want to encourage within, within the public is that um, science is just a tool, right? It's a tool for us to gain access to information. And so um, if people have a purpose, I think that, you know, they should be able to use all the tools in their toolbox, uh, the toolbox of this world, right, in order to, to achieve that. And I'd like to see more 
I, I am trying to be very active as my role of facilitating this organization to just encourage people to, to pick a purpose, right? And then begin uh, dissecting that scientifically, perhaps, right? Thinking about what, what knowledge they need to build, what skill, right? What skills might they need to, to, to address that purpose? Um, and of course, businesses, they sort of come with their own pur purpose built in, right? Entrepreneurial sorts, like they have a, uh, they have a market that they're seeking, right? And that, that they're going for. Um, but even then that purpose may shift. Like, I think it's also purpose is a very human thing, right? That like it changes based on what we learn about the world and how we shift it. And it, it can be liberating, I hope, for people that join our, our lab in order to follow their purpose to know that there's always support uh, in the way that you would choose to change. Like we're not gonna strip funding away because the purpose no longer aligns with funder goals or something like this. Like, um, yeah, we're seeking to create some common infrastructure to allow people with purpose to, to explore and, and use. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, also, as you elaborated on my shaky question, but now I like you also put some, um, foundation to it because I mentioned in the beginning um, or in, in, in framing the question that I'm personally mm -hmm. invested in global research equity and right. I mean that literally globally like where I also work with a, um, a stellar team um, for Africa Archive uh, an African open access portal um, where mm -hmm. we work towards discoverability of African research output. So that's really the global scale. And at the same time, global research equity to me also means, and now I now have a better picture of that on the national level, like to mm -hmm. allow different stakeholders. No, that's, that's the part where you come in. So the community labs allow stakeholders within society to actually meet in one space, like physically also to engage and think about and tinker with research experiments like purpose-driven mm -hmm. solution oriented and really prove and that is another level to me also of research equity mm -hmm. also on a global sense in a way because it's replicable and we also mentioned um open bioeconomy lab and um and other international spaces that aim to democratize and make research affordable for mm -hmm. researchers in any, also, also under-resourced or underfunded um, research institutions, yeah. as well mm -hmm. as, and here it comes, um, other stakeholders of society. And I also want to go towards um, maybe two or three questions from now, our conversation as the conversation unfolds, mm -hmm. also the intersection between um, the academic sector industry and community labs in between and above and as a fun fundament or fun fundamental in a mm -hmm. way or as the glue between the two in a way or where they can also involve into and i also want to mention that in the human rights declaration there's article 27 so participation and engagement in research is actually a human right. Uh -huh. and I love it. <laughs> I love that. Awesome because the way you describe biotech with our borders and the kind of work you do and the space you provide brings this to life in a beautiful way. Mm -hmm. so, anyway. Yeah. I mean, so I've been, our, our lab is, uh, so I do think very locally in this context, but of course the challenge of, of, of doing good work in society is to take those local contexts, right? But also draw those parallels to something global um, because with, like within the local context, I think there's a lot to learn in terms of uh, fitting into the community, figuring out how do we invite the community into this lab and, and not just drop them this like pay your membership fees and, and here use the equipment, but rather what sort of programming might what, what could we do to illuminate right the types of research that could be done um, by by the communities again that live immediately around us and, and may stand to benefit in some way. 
Um, and to that end, like uh, I've been trying to partner and, and successfully so, like we're going to be partnering, I guess, with the, the local library system, because I think librarians, I mean, I love librarians. I, I think that they have an eye towards access in a way that, um, yeah, in a way that really thinks about like servicing those in need. Uh, and so trying to partner with them in order to give classes to different demographics, uh, tap into those networks and, and provide our expertise. So like many of us who are members of Biotech Without Borders, we are trained within the academic system and, and we come, uh, maybe we're taking different career paths. Some people now are industry, some people are still teaching adjunct professors and so forth. Um, some are trying to work in nonprofit institutions like this, but you know, we, we recognize that there's some power in the training that we acquired in that institution. And we'd like to apply it into the world in a way that is gonna have impact. And so through our organization, through coming together in an organization like ours, we're also now realizing that um, we, can, we can support uh, community organizations by providing our skills as like teaching workshops and, and running things right in a vendor relationship with some of these organizations. And I think, think that that's like a really powerful thing just to say, getting to know those with scientific training, coming together with some shared purpose, you can find ways to enrich your local community. And then hopefully that there's gonna be something reciprocal there that then those community members will feel like that this lab is theirs as well. And we'll see how that direction shifts, right? How their priorities and how the, the projects may change within the space um, with, with input from, from more than just, right? A bunch of different <laughs> uh, academically trained individuals coming together with this shared purpose, yeah. <laughs> So I, I want to take you up on the name of your space, also Biotech Without Borders. Um, mm -hmm. we, I think we've all heard of other Without Borders organizations, like uh, Medicines Without Borders, um, Journalists Without Borders, mm -hmm. Engineers Without Borders, who all literally work um, well, globally or, or especially in, in conflict regions right. on this planet. Um, mm -hmm. Do you see that you're also addressing this or is this on your roadmap to i mean in, in part yes. we already answered that but is this also yeah. part of the mandate that biotech without borders um gives itself so i think i think when the organization was initially founded that that terminology borders was meant more about like you know borders between sectors of society mm -hmm. within right within like how uh, you know, academia becomes walled off sometimes through jargon, through right inaccessibility of those resources. But um, I mean, over the pandemic, I've been thinking a lot about the name and how that relates to the type of work that we do. Um, and and I think connecting. So I, I touched on this in my last uh, response, right? That that idea of connecting the local to the global is something that it takes it takes work right like it takes work to maintain relationships like like kind of globe globe straddling relationships um and, and you know check in and, and talk about the recent developments the, the challenges that we're facing right in different global contexts and and taking those lessons and then condensing them for our membership and for people that come from the local community to be able to conceptualize better what that global research enterprise looks like Right? And, and not just from the mouthpiece of some large corporation that tells you what global research is all about, right? But like from, from a network of individuals who, who care about the world and who are trying to use science to, to make some impact, that, that I see as the primary way in which we're hitting this without borders now. So, so being a part of collaborations that are spanning multiple countries, right? Like that's, that's at the forefront. Like if I'm going to get interns to work on something in this organization, we'll be, we'll be looking at research through that lens. Mm -hmm. um, but even just chatting with people that are running projects in different countries and explaining those projects to the locals here, trying to make those connections and then maybe connecting them by saying, you should join that other group, right? Like if this is resonating with you more than some, something that I'm saying, then like, it's not, it's not about me. <laughs> it's not about joining this organization, but really you should just be like hitting those people up, right? And creating those networks. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, that, that's the way that I've been thinking about Without Borders during this, during this time. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. And now coming to the intersection between academia, industry, and now community labs. 
do you mm -hmm. already have partners in either of the sectors or is it something you would wish for to have more of or would you rather stay independent of any formal partnerships with with institutional or institutions research institutions and um, industry research um, mm -hmm. for whatever reason like yeah how right. would you position community I would I would love more partnerships with those types of organizations um I do think though like so this I think goes back to those like makerspace hackerspace roots that there is this conception of trying to create our own system right where we have like a type of self-governance right where the community set the values and like we don't have to worry too much about you know adopting the, the values of some organization that, that wants to partner but at the same time like I I have to think that cooperation is the way forward. I mean, that's a fundamental belief of my, my own. And so uh, exploring what those partnerships might look like is something that I'm, I'm willing to do. Uh, I mentioned the library system, right, as a natural partner for us. Um, academia has not been the same type of partner, I would say. Like we partner with academics, right, like labs and so forth. But the institution itself, right, like uh, tapping into the administrative interface of the universities, I, I haven't, we haven't pursued that. I'm actually not aware of too many uh, or community labs that explore that interface. Uh, mostly just through individual principal investigators, right, will come. So I mentioned we have some adjunct professors that work with us. Um, I'm definitely interested in exploring collaborations with other tenure track professors or, or others, right, that have different positions within the academy. Librarians, as I mentioned, I actually think that there will be fruitful conversations to be had with academic librarians uh, mm -hmm. because like they, within that larger uh, organization, are fighting for a different type of, yeah, they're, they have their own fights that they want, right, in terms of knowledge, access, and, and equity. Um, and then on the industry side, that's, that's, <laughs> that definitely um, has been an influence for us being in, in, in this neighborhood because um, the city is, is fantastically obsessed with uh, bolstering the biotech industry, right? And becoming some competitor to attract companies and create jobs in this area. So in that way, I see a natural alignment because we want people to be happily employed, right? We want people to find success in, in their personal and professional lives. And so we've, um, right now we have, don't have any formal partnership with companies, but we do have partners. We are like working with like, uh, uh, they call themselves like a business partnership or like uh, employment, employment services, this type of organization to try to expose, you know, job seekers to the possibilities, right? So um, just, showing up at career fairs to talk about uh, the options that are out there, the many different career paths that exist. Um, that's one of the ways that we're interfacing. And I I've actually been really interested in this idea that um, companies need to do a better job about explaining the impact of their technologies to the general public, mm. not just like the investor pitch, right? Like, okay, the investor pitch, like I know they need to do that for their survival, but what about like the, the pitch that says, and here's how our technology is helping you. And then an open platform to ask questions, right? How, how does, you know, why do you think that this is going to help us, right? Like, how, like who exactly is that population? Mm. I think that that would be a really interesting partnership that I'm, I'm willing to engage in. Um, but I haven't really had the time yet to 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 make those connections. Hopefully, you know, in a year we'll see we'll see where these uh, this is developed. <laughs> yeah, it sounds certainly um, worthwhile to to continue following up with as a line mm -hmm. of thought. Um, we mentioned that you had busy spin-offs out of the tinkering in the space that then mm -hmm. um, joined a, a startup accelerator program. Um, yeah. Let's talk a little bit about the funding of research in general, how you've observed research is being funded in academia and the opportunities you see in funding the kind of work you're doing. Also facilitating mm -hmm. research for some. You mentioned that you have some researchers actually finish or or start exploring um, proposals um, to, to pitch to investors in the industry side or mm -hmm. research funders and academic um, com uh, components. Yeah, like a uh, public-private partnership stuff. In the states, they call them SIBR grants, 
um, that's oh, yeah. like specifically yeah. like you, you, you're, you have to be outside of the academic system. You have to have a partner company and then you provide some initial data to, to apply for this type of grant in order to see if that could, you know, develop the business further, something like this. <clears throat> It looks like um, the community space is very much already like a seeding lab in a way, like mm. to, yeah, to provide the environment to actually plant a seed for a project that then can grow mm -hmm. into a startup, which then eventually can grow into a company. Um, yeah. But also on the research side, yeah, to develop research ideas and, and start testing and then getting mm -hmm. funding for it and off you go for a three or five year research project. Yeah. So how, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> what's, the, what's the financial backup for that in society? <laughs> like, yeah, I mean, I, I guess the unfortunate part about this reality is that members fund out of their own pockets in all of these cases, right? Yeah. So um, like, at least for this initial step, right? Like, it's um, the, the service that, or the, the benefit that we offer as maintaining this lab as infrastructure, right? Uh, at the end of the day, like people, ha we have to contribute together to keep the space open. Um, and as well, like people have to buy their own reagents and so forth in order to, to do that experimental work. Um, I've been, one of the, my dreams of, so like, we're working as a collective right now at Biotech Without Borders. And so like one of the directions that I'm trying to push us towards is uh, becoming like a fiscal sponsor for small projects. Uh, it's actually quite common in the arts, right? To have um, organizations provide like fiscal sponsoring for an artist to run a project. So that provides them like a financial container to store money, right? We have this tax-free status. Um, and so I, I'm interested in expanding that for, you know, small invest, like an investigator, right? Whether that be at the beginning of a business, whether that be curiosity driven, whether that be, right, uh, to, to cr create initial grant data. Um, yeah, like trying to build out that part of the administrative services that we offer as an organization. So like, so there's an administ there's an infrastructure layer that we're trying to offer. And then there's also an administrative layer that we offer. And both are geared towards um, as, as we've said before, democratizing biotechnology, uh, increasing access to this, uh, and then, and then, yeah, bringing people together to also chat because the, the chatting and the, the communicating of your project is so important as well. This is something that I love when I was in academia, right? Like to be in a lab, everyone has their projects. You have a lab meeting, you're chatting, like you go to conferences, like, uh, but but to open that up for even more people to join right and, and show people that that's like a place that uh you can really develop your ideas and, and really find you know lifelong colleagues in some in some instances right when you find the right person that clicks with the way that you think that can be really valuable so so anyways uh yeah trying to be a fiscal host uh is is the the thing that we're thinking about in terms of funding um but yeah, we're, we're a low resource lab. <laughs> like I mentioned before, like wanting to work on Frenzymes and the open bioeconomy, that comes from a place of solidarity. Like, uh, like we're not a funded, it, our funding structure isn't like a, you know, generous grant or, or a large institution backing us. We're funded by our members. And for the members that do become successful in spin off companies, like they are able to contribute more than the members that don't. But uh, yeah, that's that's where we're going. That's what we're going for here is, is a very grassroots funded organization, and we invite others right to benefit from what we're bringing together to to fundraise themselves right at the grassroots level to try to get their projects off the ground. Yeah, uh, and I've you're also not alone with this approach because the commons, or it's commonly known as the commons, is a is quite a common <laughs> approach. <for laughs> <laughs> like also wikipedia uh -huh. has grown into a massive online resource or the biggest online mm -hmm. resource ever with the same approach so it's not so utopian or visionary anymore to mm -hmm. as much as it's a stretch for resources um like w the other question would be if we would see it more negatively like why why is it still so difficult to why why do do we have to struggle to build community so much where the value is so obvious? Um, mm -hmm. But maybe I think there aren't. 
of um no I, I think there there is a bit of a struggle and because because one of the the first things that we thought about was looking for grant opportunities in order to fund the organization but grants often fund programs <laughs> right so like they want to see like the impact on like how many people are going through the program right and, and so forth it's hard sometimes to find infrastructure grants right like infrastructure grants are given to large institutions but infrastructure grants for small institutions right i mean that's what i envision us we're like a tiny institution <laughs> that 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 doesn't I, I think there's a little gap in funding there but again you know this this might also be my ignorance in some ways like i'm still i'm still working to get our capabilities up and, and attract more members i haven't focused a lot on looking for those particular grants but i would say that that's something that you know, if there's grantors listening, right? Like, like thinking about small scale infrastructure grants, like seems like a really useful, useful thing. Yeah, I think it's also, I also with the initiatives that I coordinate and work with other um, colleagues to pull off, I find the idea of having to ask for money for something that's so obviously valuable. Like, why can't we, <laughs> turn the wheel and rather showcase what we do and have investors pitch to invest in us and when we select <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> I don't, I don't. what's your purpose like where is this money coming from <laughs> like okay <and laughs> literally have an ease to cherry pick the best fit mm -hmm. for the kind of work we do yeah, that sounds wonderful. When you, when you find out the organization that does that work, like connect connect me, please. <laughs> yeah. um, okay. Well, I think again, like I think this triangle between academia industry, community labs is a perfect um, perfect model for engagement. Mm -hmm. And earlier, I, had, I just had a vision of um, any research or biotech research lab using the community space um and particularly your hospital tech with our borders mm -hmm. um to instead of an open door day at the university but to come and showcase the kind of research they're currently working on um design yeah. a small scale experiment thereof and then you know use that as science communication as part of their degree like they have to do that and it's also fun mm -hmm. and engaging and and rewarding to do it <laughs> absolutely absolutely yeah as i said like when i first taught classes within this space right to, to the general public showing the general public a restriction digest right and, and how like this is a, a ruler for dna the the questions and the engagement like it's it's a mutually beneficial relationship right to be able to impart that knowledge in a way that you don't normally speak about it and then and then yeah and then take those thoughts and understandings back with you to the lab and just have that richer view of 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 the work of science within within society contextualize a little bit better i think that there's a lot of a lot to be gained by um by flipping through these different types of institutions and, and trying out your skills within each of them, right? And seeing what impact it has. <clears throat> Do you feel you have a mandate and research integrity with the approach and the opportunity that community labs bring? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's just interesting. Um, I don't think I've thought too explicitly about that particular topic, but I will say this, that one of the issues within research integrity integrity is about incentive structures, right? Like something that drives, right? Sometimes fraudulent work is the pressure, right? To remain within the system and to, you know, have a stable career. We don't work from that space at all, right? But the pressure here is, there's no pressure, it's voluntary, right? Members come if they can, if they have the finances to be able to interface with us, or even we offer free events as well, they can come out and just be part of the community. Then, then you can join this enterprise. Um, and so I would hope that the, the incentives for right, uh, fraudulent research uh, don't like, aren't generated by our institution, but of course they exist external, right? Like there's gonna be folks that maybe want to do research in this lab and will falsify their results and send them out to those granting organizations. Um, yeah, we, we we don't explicitly control for that, but I would say, I don't think academia is controlling for that either. <laughs> there's no like police at that level. Um, yeah, there's a lot of 
finger. Oh, wait. <laughs> maybe this is like a strange digression, but like I do a, I do a podcast, I do a YouTube channel with, um, with uh, a friend that I met in graduate school. Uh, he is a publisher. He works for publishers. And uh, the reason why we do this together, we do a journal club. We talk about cool microbiology news every week. Um, th the reason why we do this is because the best defense against uh, bad research is reading the research. <laughs> and uh, it's a difficult task, right? It requires, I think community is like a big part of it. Um, but like looking at those results and bringing your critical eye to them, the more people that do that, the more people that uh, comment and, and right on the status of, of different experiments, I think that makes the research more robust. Um, so yeah, the <laughs> research integrity, I think is a very systemic and complicated problem. Um, I, I, yeah, it, in so much as I don't think we contribute to that issue, but I, I haven't thought yet of how we might actually tackle it, it head on. Yeah. I think you <clears throat> did answer that when you said that the pressure is not there to stay in the systems by providing the mm -hmm. metrics. So naturally, what I understand as research integrity is like to be aware of the purpose, why we do what we do, and how do mm. we how do we accumulate the knowledge, and how how do we make sure there's accessibility to that accumulation of knowledge. And only right, then right. research makes sense. And that's basically the essence of community spaces to provide a space for learning, for exchange, for community, for, so it's basically, mm -hmm. I mean, it's almost a better <laughs> academic system. But, <laughs> um, as much as most academics wish for research to be working that way. And mm -hmm. with open science, I think we are working towards that pretty actively already. So mm -hmm. yeah, what, what does open science mean to you? Do you feel that with the work of Biotech Without Borders, you now have the opportunity to practice open science the way you always wanted to? Oh, uh, what 100%. <laughs> yeah, that's um, a yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> and again, I, I guess that goes right back to like what you picked out of my response saying that like the pressure to perform doesn't exist in, in this space in the same way. So like the challenges are different, right? The challenges are like that resource, like sort of the low resource environments is the challenge here, right? And, and sort of being able to engage community members to assist at why, whether through their own efforts, like at labor at the bench, let's say, or by donating, that I think is the, the sort of the major a challenge to overcome within this space. But in terms of doing research the way that I think is the most, like that has the highest integrity to my standards, like I don't have any barriers to that it, right in this place. Like I can, <laughs> yeah. And, and so what I've also um, been interested in, and I think I probably will, is like, I've always loved certain open research, like during graduate school, you know, I was trying to choose the tool chain that I was gonna use, right? To turn out papers day in and day out. And, and I was trying to be very careful by choosing the tool chain that, you know, would expose my work to the most scrutiny. So people could see, right, like the data processing that I was using, right, code my data, right, like put things into Zotero. I mean, all my citations, like referenceable. Um, and, and you, people can see that probably off my ORCID ID, like the one contribution, one of the contributions that I made in, in the way that I put together that GitHub page. Um, and yeah, and, and in this space, I feel like I can do that um, sort of safely, <laughs> but that's because like no one's watching me. I just, I, I do, I do it to my integrity. <laughs> well, because it's over many people are watching, but nobody's judging. Yes, yes, yes. Or they yes. might. Well, discover, better. discoverability, <laughs> I think, I, I mean, I think this is a, this is definitely a topic about open, open science is like, what's discoverability in, in open science, right? Because like, there's going to be lots of generation of stuff, right? And being able to discover it and find the things that are relevant to your particular questions across all of the different platforms that people may be choosing to publish in openly. I think this kind of remains a, it's just, it's something that has to be thought about, right? With some care uh, because, you know, algorithms will introduce bias and journals have their specific slant of which publications they want to direct you towards. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, being able to navigate across all that knowledge, I think is, 
Um, yeah, I don't know what the solution is yet, but of course it is better than <laughs> what, what we have now. So let's, yeah. let's publish openly. <laughs> we, we have an episode on that with Donny, um, who, well, it's mostly on research data management. And we also talk about the semantic um, scholarly network, so to say, to mm. how AI mm -hmm. can make sense of it. I think we have quite a few good options on the table and um, there's some decent exploration to make sense of the masses of data that's being generated in academia. Um, it's exciting. Yeah, I, it's, uh, some some to new tools I probably have to learn then, right? To, to navigate yeah, that space. Yeah, there's, there's a few tools that look very promising. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, but it's mostly through literature screening and well, open knowledge maps is one of my favorites, which oh, has visual I love open knowledge maps. And then mm -hmm. sites.io, I think it was, or AI, um, is comparing, like is analyzing the reference section of manuscripts to mm -hmm. analyze or the also the concept to analyze if there's support in the references or contradiction. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I've definitely experienced that in, in reading literature <laughs> when you go down the citation, but you're like, this is not, this is not how it's said. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but you know, it's just, well, that's, yeah, it's important to have help by machines to make sense of the, the sheer mass. And then we still need the human factor to make actual sense of it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then, yeah. And then the, the metadata, like the way, the contextualization of the research output, that's, that's, that's one of my favorite topics and it's also heavily underserved, unfortunately. So what's the use mm -hmm. of research data being generated, articles being published, if for once the articles never see the light of day, or are not accessible, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. or the the research is presented in a way that's not reproducible or is not contextualized, so we can't learn anything from it other than for that very specific purpose it was designed for. Right. Yeah, so we, I think purpose needs a better standing in research altogether, and this is again why I think community labs are so important because society and the members of society. Uh, have a chance to have a say in what kind of research is to be done mm -hmm. and, and how once it's underway how it can be contextualized in a way that right. makes well, sense for, for the when you were explaining in your in your description of these different tools that exist and and some of them are, are new right I, I will also say that community labs like we're able to adapt quite quickly to, to new tools that appear right mm -hmm. in, in the sense that right like I'm, most people who are in here, many people have said to me on the community side, like they don't care about a publication. <laughs> like they, they just want to do something interesting, right? But um, that also means that uh, they can, we can easily direct people to the tools that have the most impact, right? And we'll build, right? Because every network needs a user base. And uh, I think um, for, for researchers in community labs, like there is this opportunity to really choose just the best, <laughs> the best, the best tools from the open science ecosystem um, and, and expose our research in, in that fashion. Mm. Um, and I think it'll help too, uh, to have more people who engage uh, with research and, and putting them into the sort of academic knowledge system uh, from community labs, because like we, we too need to build um, the public's confidence in, in, in this type of organization, like community labs, not every city has a community lab. Um, it, it's not an easy thing to, to launch because, because, uh, because there are already so many uh, places that you can get paid a lot more money to do research in. <laughs> but, uh, but for those who do found some sort of lab within their city, it becomes like a labor of love to provide this infrastructure for right, uh, many different sectors of society, right, inside of academia, as well as inside of the community. Um, and so it just needs more positive press, I think, uh, in terms of, of the value that it could have to everyday folks, but also to people who are already in, in, engaged within the more traditional enterprises. <laughs> yeah. Um... 
honoring the time. I think we're approaching already um, beyond like an hour. And <laughs> um, so is there anything else? What you just said sounds like the perfect epilogue to this episode. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I think so. Uh, it was, it's nice to be able to chat about this, um, about the enterprise that we're trying to build at Biotech Without Borders mm -hmm. um, and, and hear your questions because right, it's through conversation that, um, that, that we solidify, I, I think in many ways, right? Like whether uh, our actions are aligning in the way that we think they are uh, to the external side. And uh, I'm very community minded in that I want our organization to grow through membership and through these types of conversations to be able to uh, chart a path for our organization that will lead us to some sustainability. So we're not there yet. That's like number one goal is being self-sustaining here in, in New York City. Um, and I believe it can be done uh, because there's real value to be had in working in these spaces. I think we've talked about that a bunch of times throughout this podcast. Um, and, and there's also joy to be had uh, working in community, right? With people who have similar values. And uh, so, yeah, I, I just, I'm, I'm happy that you've given us this opportunity to speak about Biotech Without Borders. And, and I hope, um, yeah, we get some, um, we get people who are interested. I'm, I'm sure there are many of the listeners um, who are very much interested in the kind of work you do. I also want to point out another episode that we had um, previously on open, no, open hardware makers program, which is mm. also not, not exclusively or, or explicitly um, open to non-academics as well to build hardware and probably also a community to keep an eye on because what um, the, the participants of these programs and they just launched um, the first cohort um, will produce, uh, some of which will probably also be applicable in community spaces like the... Oh, project. yeah, absolutely. I mean, op open hardware and, and gosh, right? Like their work has has significantly lowered the barrier to access, right? In terms of tools that we could furnish our lab with. And mm. so, yeah, I'm definitely an important part. I I'm glad that you made this connection. <laughs> so many intersections, many opportunities for partnerships, nonprofit, for-profit, mm -hmm. industry, academia, non-governmental. Um, yeah, I'm glad that, that you do this kind of work that community spaces exist as part of the ecosystem. It is a human right for any human being on this very planet to engage in research and you're providing that space. So thanks for that. And <laughs> Excellent. Yeah, and speak to you soon again. Welcome back to All right. <laughs> for another episode whenever you want to. The door, the door is open. <laughs> Sounds good. Thank you, Joe. <laughs> it was great to be here.